Good evening, if you're just joining us for this evening session of the BTO Virtual Conference. We'll be starting in about four minutes, so this is your last chance to dash to the kettle for a cup of tea or whatever your tipple is before the session starts. See you shortly. Good evening and welcome everyone to tonight's session of BTO's virtual conference. Uh, we've hosted talks every day this week and I hope that those of you who've already joined sessions during the week have enjoyed them. We're sorry to hear that, that this year the pandemic means you ca we can't meet you in person, but hopefully we're also meeting many of you who wouldn't normally be able to join us because of the barriers such as cost, traveling distance or other commitments that prevent people from coming to our conference. We're really keen to ensure that our work becomes accessible to many more people, and it'll be interesting for us to see how the reach and, reach and feedback for this week's event compares to what we would get at our normal face-to-face -face conference. There's already, uh, I can see, over 200 people connected to this session now, and many more watching on our, on our Facebook and YouTube live streams. My name's Yayan Evans, I'm BTO's Director of Engagement, and I'll be your host this evening. It's lovely to see so many familiar names in the attendee list. So whether you're a regular conference attendee or this is your first time, a very warm welcome to you all. We've been able to organize 14 talks and two panel discussions this week, all of which have been available for free 
This has only been possible thanks to the really generous support of BTO members. Income from subscriptions and donations make up almost half of our charity's total income. Without the support of our members, BTO just wouldn't be the organisation it is today. So thank you very much to all the members in the audience tonight. If you're not already a member, we'd of course love you to join and you can easily find the join link on our website. <clears throat> this is a tough time for charities like ours. If you join us for our AGM tomorrow, you'll hear that our income is really suffering due to COVID-19, making the future uncertain. We know that you support us in lots of different ways and we're grateful for all of the support that we receive from you. If you're in a position to make a donation tonight to support our work, we'd be extremely grateful and you can do so at the conference link on your screen now, www.bto.org forward slash support. <clears throat> We're in for a real treat over the next hour or so. My colleague Simon Gillings will be familiar to many of you through his involvement in various different BTO projects over his 25-year BTO career, including the leading role he played in Bird Atlas 2007 to 11, his earlier work on farmland birds, and more recently is an involvement in the analysis side of the Breeding Bird Survey. Tonight though, we've invited him to speak on a topic which I think is fair to say straddles the line between Simon's personal and professional interests. Over the last three to five years, the remote detection and monitoring of wildlife through sound has really taken off, particularly relating to the audio recording of migrant birds at night, often called knock migging. Not only has the equipment required for doing this uh, become much more affordable, but significant advances have also been made in the software available. And an energetic community of enthusiasts has sprung up, giving us, giving us regular insights into the birds and other wildlife passing over their gardens at night. Through their blogs, tweets, talks and articles, it's been a revelation for many of us to begin to understand just how much is going on in our skies while we sleep. As those of you who follow Simon on Twitter will know, He's one of those enthusiasts, but he's also leading BTO's work aimed at advancing the science of acoustic monitoring. Tonight, Simon will give us an insight into this exciting developing area and give us some thoughts about what the future holds. I'm going to ask Simon to join now to check we have him ready to begin. Evening, Jan. Hi, Simon. I'm, I'm sure Simon's talk is going to generate lots of interest, and so we've allowed extra time for questions at the end of tonight's talk. You feel free to pop any questions into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can also use this function to push questions from other attendees up the charts by giving them a thumbs up, and that will give them more of a chance for being answered. During the talk, I think Simon's also going to be inviting you to participate in a number of polls too, and you'll receive a prompt when a poll starts. So without further ado, I'd like to, on his 25th uh, anniversary of working at BTO, uh, invite Simon to uh, begin his talk. Over to you, Simon. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for the introduction. And I'll just try start sharing my screen now. Okay. Well, thank you again for the introduction, and uh, thank you everyone at home for joining this evening. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this, uh, this world of nocturnal bird migration studying. So the sound of blackbirds going to roost for many of us will be a time to press stop on our bird track lists and to stop our day's birding. But for me, this is a cue that it's time to go and put my audio recorder out. And this is an activity I've been doing for about four years now. Uh, and this all started um, in March 2017. Um, I'd been working late one evening in the shed. Um, I have a little microphone sticking out through the sh a hole in the shed wall um, so I can listen to the birds during the daytime while I'm working away. Um, and on that particular evening, about 10 o'clock, um, suddenly this happened. Now that's a pretty awful recording, but what you may be able to make out there is first the, the sounds of a moorhen flying over my garden, quickly followed by the sounds of me falling out of the shed, uh, 
to try and hear it myself because at that point I'd never heard a moorhen in my garden. Um, I live quite close to a river so it, it would be a species I thought I might one day hear but I'd never never heard one at that point. Um, and that, that recording and subsequent recordings over the following nights uh, really kind of captured my imagination as to what was flying around, what else was flying around over my garden at night. So um, through this evening, um, I'd like to talk about six main areas on this topic. Firstly, I'll give a, a very brief introduction to what is nocturnal migration, then have a little bit of a discussion around how we might measure migration, and then uh, go on to talk about what I've recorded, what I've detected in my kind of backyard nocturnal migration recording. I'll then go on to talk about how uh, how this is done, a sort of quick beginner's guide to NOCMIG recording, and then move on to how we might scale up and collect data across a larger scale, and some of the and finish on some of the research that I and others are doing here at BTO um, on bioacoustics uh, and birds and other wildlife. So first off then, what do we, what do we know about uh, nocturnal bird migration? So before I started this work, um, migration to me was seeing a wheat ear on the North Norfolk coast. Um, this bird looked particularly tired after a long flight across the sea perhaps. Um, and obviously, you know, I knew that birds arrived overnight, but I didn't really give the actual process of nocturnal migration much thought at that time. But as I've learned, and as many others like me have learned, there's actually a very wide range of species that are nocturnal migrants. Many of you might think of red wings that you might be able to hear uh, on an autumn evening as a nocturnal migrant, but many others from waders and bitterns, grebes, cuckoos, even nuthatches, where nuthatches migrate, they are nocturnal migrants. So there's a really wide range of species and species groups that are predominantly or exclusively nocturnal migrants. Just to pick an example, if you think of our summer migrants, the species that arrive on our shores in, in spring, only 20% of those are daytime migrants. The majority are nocturnal migrants. So the pied flycatcher pictured here will have arrived from uh, Africa overnight. So we're talking about a wide range of species that we're familiar with, as we see during the daytime, as that actually are nocturnal migrants. Not only a wide range of species, but we're talking about pretty impressive numbers of birds, numbers of individual birds. So sticking with the flycatchers for a moment, that's something like 30 million flycatchers are, are flying around over the skies of Europe in spring as they arrive. We can add to those about 350 million warblers arriving at night across Europe and maybe 20 million thrushes flying back north in the spring, 2 million rails and crakes and so on. I could keep on putting up numbers like this on screen. You get the idea though, this is a massive volume of birds migrating at night, which if we're honest, we aren't really monitoring very well. So how might we go about measuring and detecting those nocturnal migrants? Uh, the slide, it's a slide you've seen, uh, or an image you've seen on uh, a number of times already this evening, a bird flying against the moon. And moon watching is, is one obvious way of doing this. It's particularly popular in the 50s and 60s to count the birds as they fly across the face of the moon. If you imagine the moon as a clock face and you record the point at which the birds enter the moon's disk and the point at which they exit, you can then work out flight directions and you can work out total kind of traffic rates of birds migrating. But it obviously has some pretty clear limitations. You can only do it if you can see the moon for a start uh, and you can only really do it on the full moon. So there are limits to what you can, when you can do it, um, but some really interesting results were found from moon watching. And if you get a chance, it's well worth giving it a try if you've got a good telescope. But I should say that that thrush that we're looking at there is not drawn at all to size and scale. What it really looks like is a tiny little dot. So actually identifying birds by moon watching is particularly tricky. Another option is to use a coelometer. And this is a um, modern versions of these now use la uh, laser, but in the 
um, early earlier accelerometers were used at airports to to uh, detect the height of the cloud base for um, pilots. And you can use the same, basically a big torch pointing upwards and count the birds flying through that light beam. But if you think about it, that's basically like a lighthouse sticking upwards. And we know what lighthouses do to birds, they draw them in. And no surprise then, even in the 50s, there were studies showing that thousands of birds were drawn to and, and killed at these sealometers. So if we want a method to unobtrusively monitor bird migration, this really isn't the one to use. What's a far better way to uh, study them is to use radar. And even in the earliest days of radar, bird migration was being picked up um, and interesting results were um, revealed about really unknown patterns of bird migration by radar. And some of those studies using um, ship based ra uh, uh, ships radars, these sort of rotating beams, but there are now dedicated radars dedicated for um, looking at bird migration that actually log individual birds as they go through. And a really exciting advance, which has been um, pioneered in North America and also in, in mainland Europe is to use the Doppler radar, which we're more familiar with from uh, uh, detecting patterns of rainfall, those same radars can be used to detect flows of birds moving across the continent. And I think there's some really exciting work um, coming along that will be integrating these radar um, networks with other data sources. I'll come back to that a bit more later. But here's an example of a radar um, situated in the Netherlands running through the evening and in a moment it will reset four o'clock and then suddenly at six o'clock there's a big bloom of yellows and reds as the birds um, take off and start migrating and that's the kind of thing you imagine a network of these across the continent picking up these uh, blooms of birds as they take off. If you get the chance to look for these kind of um, radar images on, the, on uh, social media and, and so on they, they're very impressive to see. Already this week, we've heard from Colin McShane about the use of thermal imaging cameras for uh, locating and catching jack snipe. And the same technology can be used to find birds flying overhead at night. Uh, they, these cameras are expensive, but they have the potential to, uh, to be used to, uh, to pick up birds migrating. And we've also heard this week in other BTO talks about the amazing tracking work we're doing not only on cuckoos, but also owls and shell ducks and gulls and so on. So those tracking data can tell us amazing things about the kind of total journeys of these birds, but also more um, kind of fine scale behavioral information about day versus night movement patterns. There's some really amazing work done in North America using radio tracking of small catharus thrushes like this Swainson thrush. But because those tags only have a, a short range, the researchers there had to follow those birds in trucks and even small planes to stay within tracking range of the birds. So they were able to find out amazing things, but it's very, very labor intensive. But those kind of tracking data do show us amazing things about the migration patterns and the nocturnal parts of different birds' migrations. So again, it's, it's an amazing uh, technology um, that, that can, can really help inform what we know about bird migration and aid conservation. And finally, coming on to audio recording. So audio recording is a fairly simple premise really to record the flight calls of birds as they migrate overhead. And this was really um, popularized by a guy called Bill Evans in North America. Um, he invented a thing called the flower pot microphone and, and many people in North America will have one of these flower pot mics for recording bobolinks and cuckoos and things migrating over their gardens. So here's your first opportunity for a bit of audience participation. These, uh, these are all anonymous, so uh, please, please feel free to have a go and uh, identify the species that's calling on the next slide.
So which species could you hear there calling? So that's, that's great to see a lot of you guessed correctly that that was indeed the flight call of a common sandpiper. And that's just to show that um, for many species that migrate at night, they use exactly the same calls that we're familiar with from the daytime. Not quite all, and there are still some identification challenges, but many of the birds you hear will be the same as what you're familiar from the daytime. So one of the reasons I think audio recording is um, a really good option for detecting nocturnal bird migration is because you can do it from home. Uh, many of these other activities are much harder to do. Uh, sticking a radar out of your spare bedroom window isn't really an option for most people um, and some of the costs are prohibitive for some of the other techniques. Uh, whereas audio recording can be done at home, it's relatively cheap, but crucially what I think um, makes it so popular is that we can identify um, so many of these birds to this species, um, to, to species. It does of course have some limitations. We can only record the birds that are flying low enough to actually hear them. Uh, and we know from radar that some bird species, some individuals migrate way, way higher than that. So there are limitations, but it still provides us with some really useful insights into the range of species migrating over our uh, over our gardens. So knockmig was a phrase that you heard Jan mention at the start. So knockmig uh, is the study of birds flying at night by recording their vocalizations. You may also hear of people refer to it as NFCs, that's nocturnal flight calls, and that's a, a phrase more often used in North America where warblers like this, Perula warbler, um, give flight calls um, as they're migrating. So in North America, there are many more species uh, that give flight calls during migration than in Europe. Nevertheless, we have some really interesting species to potentially detect. I put a lot of the uh, popularity of NOCMIG recording in Britain, at least, down to the work done by the Sound Approach team on the south coast of England, doing uh, regular recording through autumn, showing how regularly autumn buntings are migrating completely unseen um, around the south coast of England. And their work since then, um, uh, helping us to identify tricky species groups has really helped to put this method uh, on the map for lots of bird watchers. From a research perspective, I think that a study by Michael Heiss um, really showed again, what, the, the, what we can learn from this technique. So over a spring and an autumn in the uh, in 2011 and 10, um, Michal put recorders uh, on the, at the Besh Barmag bottleneck in Azerbaijan. You may know this, this place for its amazing raptor migrations as well. So this is a narrow coastal plain between the Caspian Sea and the Caucasus Mountains, which um, funnels birds migrating both by day and night. And he was able to record these staggering totals of, of bitterns and uh, sandpipers and larks and wagtails and so on. Really showing what you can, what you can find out by systematic monitoring using nocturnal audio methods. <coughs> I think another thing that's really helped with this is social media. You can see so many people excited about what they've been recording from their um, gardens. Uh, and and it's, you know, it's, it's interesting species like uh, stone curlews, it's, it's species like common scoters, but even a species like the humble dunnock gains a different uh, perspective when it's migrating unseen over your garden. And I guess this really, this really um, peaked in uh, early spring this year during lockdown when uh, people were recording 
both by recorders and with their own ears, the migrations of common scoters passing across northern and central England from their wintering sites on the west coast in the Irish Sea, um, crossing over the country to get on their way to Scandinavia to breed. Uh, and, and, you know, it's staggering to see how the, the, the messages that these birds were on their way were alerting people to go out and listen and be able to, to pick up this amazing movement, this sort of invisible movement happening. So uh, as a bit of an introduction to what I think nocturnal record, why, it's, uh, why nocturnal recording works. And here's um, some examples of some of the kinds of species and what I've learned from my own recordings uh, in my backyard. So my backyard, my listening station is on uh, in the suburbs of Cambridge. And I just put this up really to illustrate that I'm, I'm not anywhere particularly special. I'm about 70 kilometers from the sea. Uh, my nearest big nature reserve is the Ooswashes RSPB reserve, which is over 30 kilometers away. My garden's surrounded by other housing and, ar and then arable land. In my favor, I have a river 200 meters away, but closer than that, I have a noisy social club and a road and a bus stop and so on. So it, it doesn't sort of strike you as um, a migration mecca, really. So since that, those early moorhens um, migrating around, I, I started to try and record more consistently. I guess that's my sort of BTO um, in breeding, <laughs> in breeding is the wrong term, uh, yeah, my, my BTO um, interests and that I want to do this systematically um, to see what patterns I can uh, detect by recording in a consistent way. So I record not just in the, the spring and autumn periods of main migration, but also try to record in the in the summer as well uh, to see what might be moving around that we we're not aware of. So over the last four years, I've recorded on over 800 nights. That's uh, over 5,000 hours of recordings, and that's captured around 30,000 calls of um, 86 different species. Well, at least it was 86 species until this morning when I checked my latest set of recordings. It's now 87 because I recorded uh, some uh, white-fronted geese uh, two nights ago. So my equipment journey has changed from that little uh, USB microphone, which I first just stuck out the window and then stuck in a Pyrex bowl, thinking that might act as a, as a kind of reflector. Um, I've now moved on to a proper parabolic microphone, but I've also used um, audio moth recorders and the wildlife acoustics SM4 recorders in, in a range of different situations to, to see how they work. And I think now I have perfected the moorhen. Um, the moorhen is a bird that I can hear almost every night during spring and even into summer uh, as they fly around giving that kek 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 call. But the commonest species by far that I detect, as you might expect in some ways, is the red wing. So red wings account for about two thirds of all of the birds I record. But there's a really wide range of other species. So those 87 species span terns, water birds like bitterns, um, variety of thrushes and flycatchers, pipits, um, ducks and so on, uh, and waders like wimbrel. Wimbrel are species I would, probably one of the commonest waders I record, both in spring and autumn. Uh, Wimbrel can start moving through any time from July uh, in the, on their, during their return flights. And that's probably one I guess most of us might expect to record. Um, it's, a, it's a species many people will have heard um, actually flying around in the evenings anyway. Maybe less expected. Oh. 
So that quail was was flying around singing uh, just around the dawn chorus. You could hear a robin in the background there as well. Uh, and that was a bird I was completely unaware of, was a, um, would fly around calling like that. But if you speak to many bird watchers on the continent where quail are much more common, they'll, they'll say this is a well-known activity. And I know there are birders who've been doing survey work in the evenings and have occasionally heard quail flying over. Um, and I've recorded quail two or three times most years now. And that's the sandwich turn, one of my favorite turns, one I'm always excited to see when I go to the coast. And it's nice to know that I don't actually need to go to the coast, but they're coming to me flying over my garden, 70 kilometers from the sea. And that's one of my favourite recordings, I think. It's a group of hooper swans uh, in November a year or so ago, so low that you can even hear their wing beats. Uh, I don't know how I didn't wake up and hear those, and it's a bird I've still never heard myself or seen myself from home. Uh, and they're, they're obviously quite close to us uh, on the edge of the fens. But anybody who does any amount of this kind of recording will soon amass a folder of unknowns or mysteries or UFOs. These are birds that maybe one day we might be able to identify. It's worth dipping back into these folders now and again um, because you know you never know when the penny might drop as to what something is. This particular call, um, it's a very short call um, but it sounds so distinctive. I'll just play it. a little chip note but it's so distinctive and yet nobody yet has been able to give a, a, a certain identification for that but it's still it's worth keeping these things because we're still learning what these flight calls what produces some of these flight calls in the last month or so a recordist in Spain recorded a flight calls of a black red start as it flew in off the sea and straight away people were able to say oh I've got some of those in my mystery folder so these birds, um, you know, we're still learning what some of these birds sound like when they're migrating. So as I said earlier, um, I try and record in a systematic way because it allows me to look at patterns of, of activity because I know my recording effort and I can then work out how many birds I record, how many I detect per hour, for instance. So this is an example of the seasonal pattern of, of red wing migration based on just the data from my garden. So this shows a, a pattern you might expect, a, a, a peak of, of movement in March into April, and then starting in early October, a gradual rise to a peak in the number of red wings migrating. I guess I wouldn't have necessarily expected that to carry on quite so late into December. Um, but it's a, it's a fairly standard pattern, I guess. But you can compare that then, because I'm recording in a systematic way, you can compare that with the same kind of graph for song thrush. Song thrushes peak slightly earlier in October, but what's particularly interesting for this, for me, is that song thrushes seem to be moving right through from December, January, February, March, and April. So there's, there's small numbers of song thrushes always on the move over Cambridge. Blackbirds show a similar pattern, not quite so many birds, uh, and the peak for blackbird migration is a bit later, just as we see from our daytime observations from bird track. And then the one that surprised me, I guess, when I started doing this was field fare. Not that they show a different seasonal pattern, but just that they're so rare. We tend to think of red wings and field fares in the same breath, but they are much, much rarer. 14,000 red wing calls compared to only 200. So what do field fares do? Do they not migrate at night? Do they not call? Um, I've, I've read some stories about them roosting in stubble fields, but it, um, I'm still amazed at the disparity between red wing and field fare numbers. And then lastly, the, the kind of holy grail, if you like, 
is um, picking up ring oozles. And I've, so far I've recorded 16 and they're in the, a narrow window in April and again in October when these birds pass through. Not only can we look at the seasonal pattern, but also within the night pattern, because I think that is interesting and learning this for different locations would be very valuable. So these are just the patterns for where I live. They may differ for other locations. These, um, these funny shapes, these sort of violin shapes show where they're broadest, that shows when that species is most active. So for instance, gray herons, they're, they're, um, they span the whole night, but they are commonest in the early evening and in the early morning. And that probably suggests that all the gray herons I detect are local birds that are moving between daytime and nighttime feeding areas. Contrast that with tree pipits up at the top here. Most of the tree pipits pass over between two o'clock and five o'clock in the morning. So if I really want to hear a tree pipit myself, I'm gonna to have to get up pretty early. One note that I think I do have a good chance of hearing myself is a sandwich turn because all the sandwich turns, they always go over in the first few days of September. They are mostly in the first couple of hours of the evening between nine and 10 o'clock. So I reckon I've got a good chance of, of picking one up myself, but it has become a bit of a nemesis for me. Um, and this year, um, this happened. I was walking down the garden path um, and the, the audio recorder that I walked past picked up my footsteps and I'll explain spectrograms a bit more shortly. Uh, picked up my footsteps and the cause of a sandwich turn in the background, which I completely missed. Um, so this is the one downside of not make recording. It will tell you about the birds that you missed, the ones that are while you're fast asleep, but also the ones that flew over just as you shut the back door. So I've been doing this recording at home, um, but I'm also interested in just getting a bit more experience from other locations. And of course this year we couldn't go on holiday. So I sent my recorder on holiday instead. Um, my friend and former colleague, Dan Chamberlain, who now lives in Italy, agreed to host a recorder for me. And it's been sending back these digital um, postcards to me every, every few months. So those are the calls of a couple of night herons flying over Dan's house. Um, a very, very common bird there, but it's really nice for me to, uh, to hear those. So how have I gone about making those recordings? The basic premise, as I said earlier, is pretty simple. You just have a, some kind of audio recorder that's outside capable of, of capturing these sounds. And there's lots and lots of different ways that people configure their equipment. But the commonest way really is to have one of these digital audio recorders. These are produced by companies like Zoom or Tascam or Olympus. They have built-in microphones that can be used for, uh, that can pick up the bird's flight calls. As well as a, a, a recorder, you need a memory card that can hold all of these audio files because your recorder's running for the whole night, so it leaves lots of memory to to record those long files, hours long files. And you most likely need a power supply because the last thing you want is the batteries to run out just before things really kick off. And then a crucial bit of kit is a pair of headphones because you really need good headphones to be able to listen to some of these quieter calls. But the downside for this is that you really don't want to leave that audio recorder outside in the rain and risk it getting wet. So what many people will do will be to have that audio recorder inside and then have a microphone, maybe a shotgun microphone or a parabolic microphone outside. But that's gradually getting more and more expensive as you add these other bits of kit. Instead, uh, a, a good option might be to use one of these audio moth recorders. These are tiny little bits of kit there. They take three AA batteries and that's about the size of them. Uh, but the, the amazing thing about them is that they're completely programmable. All these other bits of kit you need to go out and turn on and turn off um, every day. But the audio moth can be programmed to turn on at a particular time and then turn off again and it will run for two or three weeks completely on its own 
So my my one in in Italy is just programmed and it's sitting there turning on and off each evening and each morning. There is some compromise though, you know, the microphone for those is a, is a tiny little hole in the corner and it, there's no way obviously that can compete with a, a big parabolic microphone that's um, orders of magnitude uh, bigger area for detecting, but they, they are amazingly successful and they're used in countless ecological research projects around the world. So once you've got your recorder, where do you put it? This isn't actually that critical. Um, the main thing is you need to have a clear view of the sky. So ideally not under a tree that's not only going to um, shield the, the microphone from the bird calls, but will also be adding any rustling tree wind uh, leaf noises. In terms of locations, pretty much anywhere goes. You know, you don't need to be on a migration superhighway to, um, to pick up uh, birds. Um, you don't need to be on the coast and in fact you might be better off not on the coast because then you don't have to contend with the cacophony from herring gull colonies on rooftops and things like that. In terms of when in the season obviously spring and autumn are the peak times of bird migration but it's worth considering recording other times. Quail fly around in June and at the moment we're seeing a big arrival of white-fronted geese and bean geese. Um, after what we might think of as normal autumn migration. Um, so it's worth being aware of what's moving around and, and recording in response to that. But weather is the key one. So as I said earlier, radar shows that some birds migrate way too high for us to detect, but cloud cover definitely brings birds down lower and they, enables us to record them. Wind direction also has a bit of an effect, but the key thing is if it's too windy, you just can't hear the birds over the wind noise. So I rarely record when it's windier than 10 or 12 miles an hour. Rainfall, um, again, has, a, has some effect. Uh, my light, light rain associated with the low cloud can be quite good for recording birds. Uh, but it also, if you've got big weather, weather fronts, they can funnel birds over your location. So the map on the right shows the rainfall radar for the 5th of October 2019, just before midnight. And around midnight, that weather front passed over Cambridge, funneling 220 song thrushes over my garden. So it's worth being aware of, of these, not only to know when to go and bring your recorder in if it gets too wet, but to know whether it's worth being out just because you might be have birds channeled over your location. And similarly with temperature, if there's a big freeze just north of you, that might um, prompt a big movement of snipe or golden plovers and other waders. So you've got your recorder, you've set it up. The next thing to do is to go to bed. Um, you might want to put your headphones on and listen to the birds for a bit, uh, but basically you need to get some sleep because the next day you've got to copy your uh, audio files onto your computer and start processing them. And that's where we need to learn how to use a spectrogram. So another quick audience participation exercise here. I'd like you to let me know how, um, how, how confident you feel you are reading a spectrogram. Okay, so we've got a range of experience here. Some people are quite happy with reading spectrograms and some where this is completely new. So I'll go through um, how a spectrogram works here. Um, and <clears throat> hopefully by the end of this, you'll all be familiar with what a spectrogram shows. A spectrogram is, at its simplest, it's a two-dimensional representation of sound. 
on the horizontal axis, it's representing time. So as you, as you look across the spectrogram, the sounds that are later um, in a recording are on the right hand side. It's a bit like a film reel. And then the vertical axis is sound frequency, usually, usually shown in kilohertz. So if you think of a, a, a bittern call, a bittern is a very low frequency boom. So that low frequency sound will be represented in a spectrogram as being at the low end of the frequency range near the bottom of the spectrogram. In contrast, if you think about a gold crest, very high frequency sound, that would be towards the top at the high end of the spectrogram. And notice that, that that's a bit later on. So a gold crest singing after a bit and will be a little bit further on to the right along the spectrogram. And then if a bit later still, a robin sang, the robin songs are a kind of mid-range, mid-frequency sound, they'd be hovering around the middle there somewhere. So I'm going to give you an example. This is a very uh, non-Nokmig species. Um, the sharp bill is a, a type of cotinga from the Atlantic rainforests of Brazil. Um, not very much to look at, but it makes this amazing sound. So that sound, a very um, starting off high pitched whistle that gradually smoothly descends in frequency. And reassuringly, that's exactly what the spectrogram looks like. This dark line at the bottom here shows a smooth curve starting around seven kilohertz and gradually dropping in frequency through time down to around three kilohertz. And then there's some, some paler kind of echoes, if you like, of that, which are the harmonics that give it the extra kind of quality to the sound. But the main, the strongest bit is that darker lower band that shows that that frequency drop through time. And if I play that again with a, with a kind of progress bar on here, you'll see how that sound is then represented here. So any sound, any bird sound or any other sound for that matter can be represented as a spectrogram like this. So I'm now gonna show and play a few more um, appropriate knock type sounds. First off is a, a little grebe flight call and this is one that many people might initially think is a wimbrel. So that quick trill there started with a couple of high pip notes and those are visible on the spectrogram here as these little pips at the start and then a trill of six uh, of 12 or so closely spaced notes. If you contrast that with the, the, the squeal of a water rail, oops. very short pulse of sound, slightly raising and then slightly falling in frequency, which again is visible on the, the spectrogram. And then lastly, here's the uh, spectrogram of the common sandpiper that we heard earlier, the, the tiwi wee flight call that we're familiar with from the daytime uh, is, is a, a series of separate notes slightly extended. So the, all of these flight calls have these very characteristic fingerprints on a spectrogram that enables us to pick them out and identify them from other sounds. Here's a, here's a series of blackbird flight calls as the blackbird gets closer and flies over the microphone. So every, every different species has a different signature like this that can be picked out. And, and I think I find these spectrograms just fascinating to look at, not only for identifying the birds, but just to look at the range of variation in these calls. This is a, an amazing um, section of two minutes of thrushes migrating over Blauvan Bird Observatory. So every one of these vertical lines, I think these look like raindrops, every one is a song thrush call 
and then every one of these apostrophe shapes is a red wing call and there's so much variation in the shapes of these calls that we might think sound pretty much identical but actually have subtle differences when you're able to visualize them like this and i think some calls are just beautiful to look at this isn't a knock mig recording but this is a woodlark uh, a woodlark song phrase um, it just looks like writing in the sky i think a um, beautiful image but back to knock mig um, when you've got your audio recordings they may be two hours long and the spectrogram initially just doesn't really show anything. But as you gradually zoom in closer and closer, you start to see more detail in, in the image. They're already starting to appear some little features in here that might be worth looking at in more detail. And as we get closer and closer in, we see these discrete little, little dark patches, which are, as we zoom in, they resolve into those apostrophe shapes of red wings. So we can scan through these recordings quite quickly once we learn what the birds look like and what everything else looks like. I mentioned earlier that I, I live near a bus stop and this is one of those regular routine sounds of a bus breaking and stopping at the bus stop and it makes this characteristic pattern of lines on the spectrogram and this is now so familiar that it's it's something I barely even notice it's like the ticking clock so you get used to what your local environment sounds like and what it looks like on a spectrogram so you can ignore these sounds and just focus on the birds fine wave like or another easily identifiable sound that can be easily dismissed. So now you know a little bit about how to read a spectrogram. This is the next audience participation exercise. So one of these two spectrograms are the calls of a carrion crow. So I'd like you to tell me whether it's A or B is the carrion crow. So around three quarters you think the B is the carrying crow and about a quarter think it's A. And the answer is, is in, it is B. And if I play A first, notice that these are all little straight lines and that's very characteristic of, of anthropogenic sounds. Contrast that with the carrying crow where there are these sort of little horseshoe shapes Many bird sounds are made up of these little curved um, elements like this. And I think when you see a spectrogram like that, it makes it easier to hear that that carrying crow call is, is dropping its code and code rises and then falls within each note. So many of these calls, as I've said earlier, can be identified from what we know from the daytime. But if you find one that's particularly tricky, you can use resources like Xenocanto, where there are thousands and thousands of calls that you can download and listen to, compare with your own. There's also a really friendly group of uh, NOCMIG recorders on um, social media, like on Twitter and on, what, uh, on um, Facebook, um, keen to help uh, with identification challenges. And there's an increasingly detailed resource, um, species by species accounts, produced by the Sound Approach team, helping to identify both common and scarce species. Um, which, so it's, you know, the, the resources for this are getting better and better all the time. 
I've tried to collate some of this information on the NOCMIG website, where there's additional information about, uh, about equipment and how to use Audacity, the main software we use for visualizing these sounds. So once we've got these recorders out in people's gardens, what can we learn from them? So we're increasingly getting people using systematic methods and submitting data that to the Trek Talent website to um, collate the data in a consistent way. So nearly 300 people now across Europe uh, and into North Africa and the Middle East are recording and have uh, generated nearly a quarter of a million hours of, of uh, effort recording nocturnal flight calls and generating millions of, uh, of, of bird counts. But with so many people involved, and to make the data most valuable, we really need to have at least some basic elements of standardization. People starting and stopping at the same time or counting birds in a similar way. So, you know, we can, we can put the microphones out to just have a general interest, but if we want to capture data in a consistent way, like we do with many BTO surveys, we need a little bit of standardization. But that standardization means we can produce graphics like these that are available freely on the Trek Talon website, looking at the seasonality of migrants like tree pipit and autoland bunting. These two species show a pattern that's seen in many species where they are detected in far larger numbers in the autumn than in the spring. And, I, and I'm not sure um, why this is, I haven't seen a good reason for this, whether it's because the autumn is, uh, has lots more noisy juveniles calling or is it because in spring the, the prevailing winds are more likely to favour them flying at higher altitude or they're using slightly different routes? Um, I don't know at the moment. But we can also see subtle differences if we compare, for instance, for song thrush, the seasonality based on the nocturnal recordings and then the daytime record observations. You can see that on the top there, the, uh, the, the spring passage, particularly for song thrush, um, is much broader um, as detected by nocturnal recordings. Um, whereas in, in uh, daytime recordings, the, the pulse of movement seems to be much uh, shorter. And it's not just about migration either. Um, anyone who starts recording will soon record flight calls of the coot, that you just heard, more hens, water owls, and little grebes. And these aren't just confined to the spring and autumn like we might expect. If anything, they are spring and into summer when these birds are detected, suggesting this is something more associated with breeding rather than pure migration. And intriguingly, a recent study on water owls using tracking data showed the first signs that maybe they have a similar kind of breeding system to quail where they breed in one location and then move on to breed in another location, having this kind of stepping stone kind of breeding system. So I think it'd be really interesting to follow this and see how the breeding biology of these species, which are very familiar to us, how we learn more about their nocturnal behavior. <coughs> so moving on to the last section now on research and future directions. As many of you will know, uh, there's, some, there's a lot of concern about the light pollution at night. There's been a lot of research done on this in North America where uh, North American cities are very, very brightly lit. None more so than New York with its tribute in light, um, light system shining up into the sky, just like those coelometers I referred to at the start. And there's now growing evidence that this uh, nocturnal illumination causes disorientation and ultimately some mortality in migratory birds. But I've always wondered whether this is the same in, in Europe. European cities are usually not so tall and they are illuminated far less than North American cities. So does, do, our, do our cities have the same kind of impact on migratory birds? So in 2019, I, I did a fairly small scale study um, with some funding from the British Birds Charitable Trust. I bought 10 audio moth devices and then distributed them among residents in 
the city of Cambridge where it's brightly lit and in some of the darker villages. Now, I had 22 volunteers. Each one had a recorder for 13 nights, each one recording for 12 hours a night. And you quickly amass three and a half thousand hours of audio recordings, which even for me is too much to process manually. So I've been working uh, in over the last uh, winter trying to develop um, machine learning techniques for processing these recordings. And in order to do that, you first need a reference library of recordings to, to train these machine learning algorithms. So in, in addition to my own recordings in a variety of locations, I'm very thankful to the European NOTME community who provided recordings from a range of, of different countries on a number of species to help me build up this reference library for um, developing these uh, automated techniques. And what those mean is that by, you, by developing artificial neural networks, uh, these are um, computer algorithms that are often used in big business for things like um, advertising or for, um, for uh, sales in, in many big supermarkets. Those same kind of processes, uh, algorithms can be repurposed for identifying uh, bird flight calls. And the ultimate goal is to have a system that will scan through recordings and like in this case, it will put in the labels where it thinks the different species are. So it will say, oh, there's a red wing here and there's another red wing here. Oh, and there's a blackbird here and so on. And these, and I've successfully developed a, a neural network that can identify um, upwards of 90% of red wings and blackbirds and song thrushes in these long audio files. But we can't just rely on that on its own. We need to validate that. And one way to validate that is to compare it against manually processed information. So here's an example from that autumn 2019. This is the data from my own recording location. These gray bars are the nights when I recorded and the black bars are the numbers of blackbirds I recorded on each night. And you can see there were small numbers until we get to the end of October when there was a big spike in blackbirds on the 29th of October. <clears throat> if I now show the locations that had a, an, an audio moth and the number of, of blackbirds that the, um, the machine thinks are there, you see this pattern. <clears throat> so reassuringly, the, the neural networks were able to pick out blackbirds in the same pattern <coughs> as, the, uh, as my own data. So in all the locations that were working on that particular night, the 29th of October, they all had a big movement of blackbirds that night. <coughs> so I can formally analyze that and, and, and see how the, the call rate of blackbirds per hour varies through the season, peaking at the end of October. And we can do that for the other thrushes, seeing there's an earlier peak for redwing and a yet earlier peak for song thrush, just as we would expect. And then I can say, okay, accounting for that seasonal pattern, is there any effect of the street lighting? And sure enough, there is. So in, for all three species, the call rates are, are three to four times higher in the lit areas compared to the darker areas. So that really does suggest that even though our cities aren't as bright as the North American ones, they do have some influence on, on these migratory birds. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now this work um, parallels work that my colleague Stuart Newson is doing on bats. Stuart has spent the last few years doing a similar, similar process of developing uh, classifiers to identify bats from audio recordings. And that's reached a stage now where we can automatically process thousands and thousands of, uh, of hours and gigabytes of, of bat data, and then use those to produce maps like this in the bottom left, showing the distribution of nocturnal bats in Southern Scotland. We can then use those maps to infer the likely impact of, um, of wind turbines in different locations on local bat populations. Stuart's now extending that work so that it can identify different bat species in Europe as part of, a Euro of our Endangered Landscapes program work in Belarus and Ukraine. 
Um, he's already been extending the classifiers to work on bush crickets and has a paper coming out in British Wildlife this month on the acoustic identification of small mammals. So we're gradually building up these techniques that can automatically identify a range of taxa from acoustic data. And we're shortly going to be launching what we call the BTO Acoustic Pipeline, which is a, uh, an online system that allows you to upload audio files to be processed in the cloud, applying these cutting edge identification algorithms to then generate feedback to you on the species that have been recorded uh, in a consistent way. And that's something we hope will go live in the next few weeks. And in time, we hope to be able to add more species and more birds to this system. So just some final thoughts then. As an individual, um, not meg recording has definitely added a new dimension to my birding. It's definitely a different kind of dimension, um, but it's, it's one I really enjoy. Um, it's really helped me in times when I've not been able to get out birding as much as I would like to in a kind of traditional sense. It's allowed me to experience migration at home and not needing to jump in the car and drive to the coast all the time. And I know that I can val contribute valuable migration data. There have been some challenges and I've learned a hell of a lot about flight calls and that means my birding is now better. I, I'm picking up birds in the daytime that I didn't know their flight calls of before now. And then if you think about bird observatories, these kind of data can really nicely complement the daily census counts because those counts are often counting the birds that have paused their migration. And these data from NOCMIG are, are counting the birds that are resuming their migration, carrying on directly overhead. And there's potential to compare these data from year to year, perhaps looking at phenological change and long-term trends. For bird clubs, these data have potentially a valuable source of records for under-recorded species and the potential to see novel trends. Colleagues and uh, friends um, who do not make recording in Cambridgeshire, for instance, together we've recorded um, many more tree pivots than really are ever seen in the county. Now this does pre present verification and presentation challenges, but I'm sure bird clubs are, are up for this to see these, these new sources of information integrated with traditional data. And you can see how um, scaling this up to national and continental um, scales, we can aggregate these data to look at migration patterns on really big scales, looking at little known species. And I hope increasingly integrating these data with sources like radar and tracking to piece together the complementariness of having the full height data from radar, but the species identifications from NOCMIG. And we can use this to tackle applied questions. But whether you're interested in these big questions or just interested in what species are flying over your garden at night um, and picking up coots, uh, I really would recommend if you get the chance, grab a microphone, give it a try. Um, it's great fun. Um, uh, so thank you all for listening. And thank you to the many funders of this work and my collaborators and colleagues and the volunteers who've participated in this work so far. Um, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Simon. That was so interesting and informative. I love that your response to lockdown was to send your recorder on holiday. <laughs> um, we've had questions pouring in during your talk. Um, so while you uh, get a drink, um, I'll blow your nose. <laughs> I'll pass some of those on to you now. So uh, the first one is about differentiating between migrants and local birds just flying around at night. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? Um, so the first thing is just differentiating between birds that are not even flying uh, and those that are flying over. So anybody um, in a brightly lit location will know that the red, the robins and blackbirds start singing at one o'clock in the morning in spring. So that, that's a challenge, just figuring out what's flying, what isn't. Um, it's often easier to see, uh, it's often clear that birds flying over on a spectrogram are very clear and um, whereas the birds that are kind of at lower level, they, they're they echoing off buildings. So the spectrograms look a little bit fuzzier. So you can often see that birds are flying over. 
Um, but sure, you do pick up species like occasionally long-tailed tits or great tits. Um, wood pigeons amazingly seem to fly over every night. I don't know what, what are wood pigeons doing flying around every night. Um, so there are for sure some local birds flying around and many of the moorhens and coots are I'm sure local birds. Um, but most of the resident birds aren't really moving that much. So it's pretty clear they're migrants. Great, thanks. I'm just getting a message to say lots of people on social are hoping you get well soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sort of related to that question then, Simon, is how do you detect the number of birds, particularly if they're moving in, in groups? Okay, that's, it's really challenging. Um, and in many ways, it's really impossible. It, this is guesswork in some cases. We can only really say um, for the birds that call. So uh, you can often see um, but uh, calls overlapping and particularly if you have a stereo microphone you can see um, one individual passing by and then another individual passing by uh, but it is very tricky and you know the all of these numbers really are minimum estimates of how many birds are moving but it's worth saying that we tend to think of these birds based on how they move in the daytime you know we see big flocks of red wings moving in the daytime it's not necessarily the case that these birds migrate in big flocks at night you know, the reasons for flocking are different between the day and the night and the birds may actually be much more dispersed and not migrating in big flocks. Great thanks and uh, a question from our old BTO friend Humphrey Crick is um, how do you how do your data compare with bird track records have you tried looking at that? Um, I, I haven't directly looked at them um, so I suppose I've looked at the seasonality. So the, the, the graphs are showed around the seasonality of thrush migration. Those are very similar, um, but I haven't looked at it in a great amount of detail yet. And I think, you know, we, we're getting to the point now where we, we're amassing the kind of volumes of data we need via Trektel and to look at these kinds of questions. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's begging to be done now. Thanks. Uh, a little bit on the kit now. I've got questions from Simon Roddis and Tony Sinnott. Um, Simon asks, how much difference to the recording does a parabolic reflector make? Mm -hmm. um, would he pick up more calls if he used one? And Tony asks, if you can if you can recommend a recording outfit that's affordable, simple, and allows some standardization. Okay, right. Um, so a parabolic reflector first, maybe, Simon. Yeah, so parabolic reflectors definitely pick up more birds. Um, there's some interesting comparisons done recently. Um, I think they're available on social media, um, but there's, there's very little published on this surprisingly, but I'm, I'm, I hope that will change. But yeah, if, if, a, if birds fly in, in the kind of beam of your parabolic dish, then you will pick up more calls for sure. They have a much greater range. Um, and then in terms of affordable kit, um, well, what we said, um, so Nick Moran helped me um, do the early bits of the NOCMEG website. What we really stress there is you really need to think about what locations and situations you want to record in. If you're only ever going to be recording at home, uh, if you're only ever going to be doing NOCMEG recording, then that kind of narrows your options a little bit. But if you're ever going to want to take the kit out in the field, um, maybe do some uh, some recording um, continuous recording out in the field and maybe you need something a bit different. Um, I would say the the Tascam recorders and the Olympus recorders, Zoom recorders, which are about 100 to 150 pounds, they are very good. Um, it, particularly if you want to listen to the recordings, the uh, the audio moths are, are great, but you can't listen to them while they're recording. So um, yeah, it, it, you've really got to think a little bit about how you want to use them. Okay, great. Uh, here's an, a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, how automated could the recording be? Uh, I think you've sort of answered this. Could the BTO distribute recorders to volunteers around the country and then the results just be automatically sent back to BTO for analysis? Uh, that would be nice one day. That's, that's the sort of stage we could get to. Um, so the audio moths, they can be fully automated, so they can be programmed to turn on and off, as I said earlier. Um, we're not yet at a stage where these kind of things are networked so that they would kind of automatically upload the data. But the hope would be that these algorithms we're trying to develop would be able to do the automatic ID. 
Um, I'm always a bit nervous about this because, um, you know, BTO relies on its volunteers who are skilled bird watchers. And, you know, this is, there's, a, there's a sense of the robot stealing my job here. Um, so I think we've got to be really clear about what are the situations where this kind of equipment and technology helps us rather than kind of takes over from us. And I think doing things like detecting bats that we can't hear or detecting rare events of rare bird, you know, these, these calls are rare. So, you know, you can't sit there and listen all night. So these are the kind of situations where this, this kind of technology helps us rather than kind of gets in the way. Thanks very much. Uh, there's a question for, from Eleanor Wilkins, which is how do you factor the effects of weather into the into the perceived favoured time of movement at night across the species? Mm -hmm. That's something I'd really like to look at in more detail. Um, if you read some of the main literature, it suggests that birds mostly um, migrate. The peak counts are mostly around midnight. But the data I've looked at from my own locations suggests that's really variable. So um, I was recording uh, in, in uh, North Norfolk earlier this year and the, the timing of arrival of red wings into North Norfolk varied on a nightly basis. So some, some nights birds all arrived in a big rush around 5, 6 a.m. in the morning and other nights they were scattered through the whole night. And I'm sure that's partly due to prevailing wind direction and it's something I'd like to look at but haven't done yet. You mentioned uh, thermal imaging earlier, Simon, and we've got a question from Ben, ben Dolan, who's talking about um, how they use the thermal imaging um, camera they've got to watch the skies and count the birds going over. And he wonders if you combine the two technologies, if it would be a good way of identifying, you know, identifying species more accurately and counting more accurately. Absolutely. I'm sure it would be, because one of the things we don't know is how many birds um, we're missing because they just don't happen to call within range you know that they're, they're, they're low enough down to hear but they just don't call in the as they pass over and we know this because you pick up the the wing beats of, of thrushes and they don't call when they're going over so you know again all of these numbers are, are minima and i think that's a good a good case where combining the different technologies will help us get a more accurate picture of the numbers the real numbers Uh, this is a bit lighter for you, Simon. What bird were you most excited to record in your garden? Any scarcities? Uh, <laughs> well, um, I mentioned the sandwich turns already. That's become a bit of a nemesis. Um, uh, in my first year recording, I recorded what I'm pretty, still pretty sure is an autoland bunting, which is, um, you know, still a, a, a very rare bird. Um, I don't know. It's sometimes it's the the ring oozles, but. I'm just still um, excited when I record a dunlin, you know, to, to have this, you know, 30 gram dunlin that's whizzing over Cambridge, belting out these its shrill calls, that, that still just gets me every time. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Dan Stowell was uh, impressed with the effect of light on the three um, bird species. He's asking if that work's published somewhere. Uh, it's in review at the moment. Okay. And um, Peter Sutton was asking, what does the higher call rate signify? Higher call rate, sorry, on... The effect of light, what does the higher oh, call yeah. rate signify? Yeah, so um, I, I think this is, again, one of those cases where I can't fully answer the question with audio data alone. So um, my suspicion is that the birds are attracted to the city on a kind of broad scale. You know, they're kind of homing on the city. And then maybe they form these kind of loose aggregations. And then, you know, most of these calls we think are social cues. You know, the birds are using them to communicate in some way between each other. So as soon as there's a group, they're obviously going to call more. So I think it's a kind of a, a combination of be, birds being drawn together and then calling more when they're together. But that's where really the, the night scopes or the radar will really confirm that. Ian Bainbridge asks, uh, are field fares silent migrants? I don't know. I'd love to know the answer to that. Yeah. But I, I had no idea that they that these are, there's suggestions that they roost um, on the ground. 
there have been some cases of them roosting on the ground at night. Okay, thanks. Question from Anna. For keen but not expert bird identifiers by sound, how would you recommend identifying the sounds you start to record? Are there good uh, support resources you could recommend? Um, yeah, so I think um, uh, I think these are gradually building up. So the the sound approach web pages are they're good, but they're they're very detailed. So they quite quickly get into some of the scarcer species, like some of the flycatchers. Um, I think just using the apps like the Collins Bird Guide app, which which have calls that you hear in the day, because most of these birds are producing the same kind of calls as in the daytime. Okay, thank you. There's a question from Dan Snowden. If collecting data for a project aiming to inform local habitat management, what additional data, controlled variables, would you recommend collecting and recording? For the, for the nighttime recording, then I think the main thing is to record, um, uh, is the recording effort. That is really the key thing. So what time do you start and stop recording? And ideally recording the numbers per hour so there's a question earlier about the um, weather conditions. So if you record the, the number of birds, or if you kind of extract rather, extract the number of birds per hour, then you've got a much greater opportunity to then say, um, you know, the numbers dropped at a certain point because uh, the sky cleared or whatever, it was, the wind direction changed. And I think you need that to then be able to then answer the other questions. It then depends whether you've got a good weather station nearby, probably. Um, you know, I, I know that there's a, a, a university weather station that I can get um, good quality rainfall and, and wind direction data. So if that's not available to you, then you maybe you need to, to measure that stuff directly yourself. Thanks. There's a question from a certain Andy Clements. I don't know if it's the one that you and I know or not, but he asks, uh, can you program audio moth to take account of the standard variation in day length to sync with civil dawn and dusk? Um, I don't think you can at the moment. Um, you certainly can't on the, the, uh, the, the last version of the app that I use, but they are adding extra functionality all the time. Great. If we can stretch you to a couple more, Simon, then we'll uh, mm. let you finish off. Uh, we've got a um, question about why we don't allow knockmig uh, counts in bird track. Uh, well, we do. Um, you can put them in. Um, I guess the, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing systematic recording, then I think at the moment the track telling the website and data um, sort of protocols are better suited but you can put NOCMIG data into BirdTrack. And indeed, all the data that go into Tractor and are copied across into BirdTrack every night. So all of those um, NOCMIG data go into Tractor and into BirdTrack and then are available to bird recorders and, and so on. So, so yeah, the data can go into BirdTrack if you want to. Okay, thank you. And Ian Bainbridge asks, are you recording the calls on spreadsheets so you know how many and how often? Um, <laughs> I don't have an example here, but I'm, I'm recording them on uh, sort of tallies uh, in a notebook and then they go directly into track talent. Okay, thanks. Another one from Humphrey Crick. Have you tried recording diurnal migration? It says, could this have some advantages given the height and speed of birds migrating? Makes them difficult to see and many could be missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I often leave my recorders running in the morning because you, know, you often get a, a flurry of uh, finches and wagtails and, and so on migrating just after dawn. Um, and, you know, that's uh, there's species there that I, I've completely missed in the past. Uh, and people have um, set up recorders when they've been doing visible migration counts and then checked later and, and realised they've completely missed certain species, particularly if it's really busy and you have you know, lots and lots of chaffinches moving through, they can sort of drown out uh, something scarcer. So, so yeah, it is definitely used. I think it's, um, the trick though, is if you're analyzing these data visually, as we do with the NOCMIG data, it's much harder to see the calls if there's a kind of mass of birdsong in the background. You know, you don't get that so much at nighttime, um, but yeah, it, it's definitely worth trying in the day if, it's, if there's not too much kind of competing sound. Simon, with the audio moth, can people buy that in the UK? 
Um, you can buy them in, um, they are, at the moment, they're mostly built on demand. So um, there's every few months, there's a campaign where um, they say we're going to build a load. So people sort of basically um, put in their order. And when there's a minimum order reached, then the factory we, uh, in, in America will be told, okay, build a thousand or whatever it is. And then they'll, they'll appear on your doorstep a couple of months later. Um, there are quicker methods, but they're a bit more pricey, I think. Um, but that's that's the main way most people get them. You can, okay, you can so order them online. Great. All right, Simon. I think that's uh, most of the questions done. So I think we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. Uh, we had over 275 people online at one point there and uh, loads of questions. So everybody was thoroughly engaged. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope everybody uh, online has enjoyed the talk tonight. Um, I'm sure many of you will be inspired to join the knock migging army with Simon, or at least to follow the discoveries of those uh, who are already doing it. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, now more than ever, BTO relies on your support uh, because of the impact of the pandemic. There are lots of ways to support this, and I know that many of you already do great things for us. But right now, if you can uh, help us by giving a donation, we really appreciate it. Uh, you can do so by following the link that's on your screen just now, bto.org forward slash support. If you're a BTO member, then please join us for the AGM tomorrow at three o'clock, which will include a message from our president, uh, Frank Gardner. We'll then continue our offering of free events open to all at 5.30 with a live discussion between our outgoing CEO, Dr. Andy Clements, and our new CEO, Professor Juliet Vickery. And uh, that's gonna be chaired by a member of the Youth Advisory Panel, who is all set with some really challenging questions for them. After that, at 7.30, you can join us for our Witherby Lecture, which this year is gonna be presented live from North Carolina by uh, Professor Karen Cooper, who specializes in using citizen science to advance our understanding of birds and wildlife. And she's an expert in science communication, so I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a brilliant talk. Uh, until then, or until next time, I uh, hope you've enjoyed your evening. Thank you for joining us, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>